Hello, welcome to this episode of Statistically Insignificant. This is a bit of a special one. Uh, it's the first in a three-part series about... Uh, I was trying to sniff the microphone. A three-part series about mutual aid as a practice, uh, like the logistics of doing it is what we're going to be talking about today. Next episode, we will, next episode, we'll be talking about how mutual aid can exist as kind of an expression of an individual sense of ethics. And lastly, the third episode is going to be about mutual aid as an expression of political ideology. It's going to be I, difficult to, um, to sort of keep those things separate <laughs> and talk about it. Yes, I know. This is the major challenge for you, Dean, is to <laughs> let this be the logistics episode and not spend the next hour and a half ranting about ideology. I want to point out, by the way, that it, mutual aid, obviously, we get involved with it for its own sake. Like, obviously, there is a political element and it's nice to, you know, express your values in that way. But... You Ultimately, can just help just, people because yeah, they need help. Yeah, we just want to help people. Right? We just want to be... And, and in many respects, that is the the exercise or the practice of mutual aid. Stripped of any context is just somebody needs help and you do it. Exactly. So yeah. even when I begin to um, rant or resist ranting on this episode <laughs> about a sort of ideological element, yeah, at the end of the day, it's helping people who need help and none of my word salad will uh, infringe on that. And also the experience of, of doing mutual aid is not ideological you just meet somebody you feel an empathetic response and say i would like to help you and then then they often go oh no i don't actually need it i'm a bit embarrassed about needing it and then you have to go no really let me fucking help you (laughs) yeah and but the the experience of it is not you're not in the moment thinking ah good a an opportunity to to exercise my political ideology (laughs) right usually just like ah shit that sucks do you need help (laughs) afterwards you can go oh that feels good it was nice to do something in alignment with my um my beliefs yeah yeah. i'm probably gonna have to issue a few disclaimers at the starts of these episodes not so much for this one but for the next two but for this one i will issue the disclaimer that it's my second day of trying to quit smoking so i do want to oh dude (laughs) i do want to run across a a mind feel like one of those Hezbollah guys in the Iraq-Iran war. <laughs> um, so if I'm a bit off, that's why. Mutual aid is fundamentally a needs-based direct redistribution of resources. So I have something that I'm not currently using. Somebody else needs it. I will give it to them so that they can use it. Basically, it's typically informal or very small scale. When you get to the level of like institutions, that it's not necessarily a mutual aid sort of thing. It's more something that operates at like a higher level of structure. I consider it to be quite distinct from charity, which Mm. we'll get into more at another place, mostly because charity is usually kind of a, a... hierarchical system which is built to entrench existing power structures. So this is why you see rich people doing a lot of charity because fundamentally it doesn't threaten their position as rich people. Right. And it's, it's, it has all the the classic liberal hallmarks of sort of means testing and trying to tweak systems, etc. And no, I'm not people, saying that yeah. charity is inherently bad. I'm just saying that as a system, it's distinct from from mutual aid. The kind of bounding principle of mutual aid is not that somebody is somehow morally deserving of help, it's that they need it. Mm, and yeah. that is sufficient. And like there's a what the old light about communism from each according to their ability to each according to their need is kind of represented here, but in a sort of informal person to person horizontal manner, which is kind of why it is mutual as opposed to top down or charity based. Yeah, on the on a basic level, it can be providing food if somebody's hungry. Like if you have a, a community food bank or something where yeah, you like, pull resources and then give it out. People with excess are able to provide to that, and then uh, it's able to be distributed to those in need. But it's I don't know. It, it, to me, I know mutual aid when I see it. Is there like a, a straight up <laughs> definition? Um, I apart don't... from people mutually aiding each other. <laughs> well, I don't know, and I think that like there are things that are mutual aid that people are not consciously doing as examples of mutual aid, right? Right. Yeah. So I would say that basically anything where somebody helps another person directly in order to help with a perceived need that would be mutual aid to a to a reasonable definition. Well, how about I mean, so if I see somebody in need, I don't know, and I just uh, provide what they are in need of. Yep. I might call that aid. What? How do we take that to the 
to the idea of mutual. Isn't the idea that it's like a network in some ways, because like in giving it, you may need it in the future yourself. You can draw upon it in the same way. So I feel like the kind of fundamental structure that you are trying to do, and this is kind of getting a bit into the political project of it, is that when I have excess or surplus, I can give it to other people. At some point, I may need help, in which case I can potentially ask those around me who are bought into the principles of mutual aid. Right, yeah. And so that mutualism is there. Well, it's like when we were, episodes ago, we were discussing the idea of the the quote-unquote grandmother problem. And listener, if you don't know what that is, it is the idea that um, anthropologists, male anthropologists... Not say, just. Not just, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a riddle, like... What? Why don't societies hang on to old women who aren't useful for anything anymore? Well, also in particular, women tend older women, postmenopausal women, live longer than men. Right, exactly. And so I would. We came up with the um, startling hypothesis that um, people love their grandma, and people would <laughs> like to live in a society where they don't utilitarianly execute their grandma. And by the same means, I would simply like to live in a society where mutual aid takes place, where people help those um, around them who need help. So, yeah, if I do it, I then You are being the change society. you want to see in the world. Yeah, pre- precisely. And, again, not getting into the politics, but it does also, when somebody has mutual aid given to them, it makes them aware of the concept of mutual aid and maybe they'll be more yeah. inclined to do it later. I mean, again, this is the question of, like, people do this, I won't call it unconsciously, but people do this without doing it as a deliberate and overt act of mutual aid, right? You help the person who needs help. Right, yeah. We it's, don't want to sort of... We are, I am imposing a kind of broader structural and a broader intent on that, which is to deliberately and overtly construct systems of mutual aid because you think they are useful and beneficial. Right, exactly. We don't need to necessarily intellectualize the human desire to help other humans. Yeah, and this episode is specifically about how you do that. Uh, what I would say is, though, that um, people do tend to intellectualize their instincts away Ooh. from it. Mm. Like that shit about, like, don't give money to homeless people and then, Oh, like, boy, will we talk about that. Give yeah. it to homeless charities instead and shit like we that. We will talk about that. Oh, don't you worry. Mm, I sense some ideology at work. <laughs> <laughs> Not in this yeah. episode. No, no. <laughs> so some examples of mutual aid are the sorts of things that I typically do, which are mutual aid funds. So this acts as a, a pool of money within a community that people can just request resources from and other people who have spare money will donate to. That's broadly what I'm going to be talking about today because it's an extremely flexible model and because money being, you know, the medium of exchange under capitalism is a direct way of giving somebody the ability to do the things that they need. Money is power. You're giving a disempowered person power. Yeah, precisely. Directly. Also, so many of the problems that people come up against are relieved by access to money. Yeah. And so many of them are a direct result of not having access to money. Yeah. So sharing hormone treatment has been a long tradition among trans people. For example, that's another form of mutual aid. It is typically informal, often because it is in some cases criminalized because they are sometimes controlled substances. Bail funds are another. These are popular in the US because fuck knows they need them. But even something like, hey, your friend can't afford groceries, so you buy them a week of groceries or whatever. These are kind of direct provision of material goods, but there's also labor that you can do or work that you can do. So giving- You don't have to throw cash at it. You don't have to throw cash at it, particularly if you don't have cash, but helping somebody with a task that they cannot do, like helping somebody with a disability who can't clean their house very well, or giving somebody a lift, or even helping somebody move. These are acts of labor that help with somebody's material conditions in a mutual fashion. If like your uncle asks you to help move house, I don't think that's necessarily mutual aid, because that's sort of the drawing on the familial connection, but yeah, I just but want to make a ex- distinction between well, no, I mean, certain uh, acts of... Um, well, I mean, there, families there are, are, are There networks. are acts of familial obligation, right, right? Exactly. which is yeah. not quite the same to an act of mutual aid, where mutual aid is like... Something that you voluntarily buy into. Yeah. 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 On the, on the perspective that it is mutually beneficial. Right? I've heard the term or the phrase pay it forward a lot, which is basically when people have something given to them or something helped with the person who provides the help doesn't ask for anything in return, but instead says, hey, pay it forward. When somebody else asks you for help, you provide that assistance because somebody has helped you. Do you ever read the book called Pay It Forward? No. It was really quite awful. Oh, no. <laughs> this, this sick kid comes up with the idea. Says, why don't does everyone just be nice? And then it skips ahead and the world is fixed. 
<laughs> and the woman who, uh, no, who was the, the, I think it's like the mother of the child who dies or whatever, gets in a car crash and the guy says, you just have my car, pay it forward. And it's just, it's not very good. So we endorse pay it forward in a non-stupid sense. <laughs> but that book fucking sucks. As much as I endorse socialism, I do not endorse utopian socialism in any form. <laughs> no, film. dystopian socialism only. <laughs> I want cyberpunk, damn it, in the cool way. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Instead of the shit way that we actually have. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. Uh, just an aside, I, I am of the opinion that um, cyberpunk was uh, right on so many things, except that the future would be cool. Yes. We have so many of the things that cyberpunk predicted, but none of the cool bits. You can't do anything in an interesting way. It's all the most awkward, cringe shit imaginable. Yeah, like Mr. Beast energy drinks. There's no like cool like neon signs with like Japanese writing on them that I've I seen. Say, at least. I mean, like, Chinatown has some of Chinese writing on them, which <laughs> I was is kind say, of equivalent. And nobody's attacking the authorities with a katana, but somebody did do that on a military base in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, and a guy apparently in the U.S. drove into a cop shop blaring guns at roses. <laughs> and then immediately got arrested. It was like, oh no, it was an accident. Coward. All right, well, all I'm saying is... <laughs> you say arrested. He got fucking done on terrorism charges. I know. <laughs> this is the most bullshit thing I've ever okay, heard of. Okay, well, Guns N' Roses ain't great, but that's a little... <laughs> I actually fucking love Guns N' Roses. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So I, I have to say, I've run a mutual aid fund, like that centralized pool of money thing for a couple of years now. The number of times that I have meaningfully and significantly changed the course of somebody's life with a well-timed few hundred bucks. You and the people, other people contributing. Yeah, well, me as organizing the fund, yes, is just fundamentally insulting to the humanity of everyone involved. Yeah. Yeah. And that is something that I experience as an immense source of anger, but also like an immense source of like satisfaction and pride that I am able to help people with other people's money. But to be able to do that and to be in a community where that is the thing that is done, it is hugely satisfying. And I mean, one of the reasons we're going to talk about this as an expression in the next episode of individual values is because you do get a fundamental satisfaction out of doing it. Yeah, it is, um, it's good, clean fun. <laughs> yeah, literally. Unless it's dirty money, in which case, salacious. In which case, it's cool, clean fun. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As Tess said, it's, it's frustrating that somebody can be- a 300 few bucks away from destitution. From an unrecoverable- collapse of their life or something that would cost them years to recover from and it, a mutual fact it's great that it exists but it does fill you with rage rage it is genuinely rage <laughs> that people can be put in that position by by society the again the mutual aid fund should not have to exist this should no. be the function of a government yeah. yeah and one of the things that i think of when i think of mutual aid is the failure of the state to do things right and it's very topical in the age of the state failing, failing. yeah <laughs> all over the place shout out to our british listeners i know there's a few well you don't think that shit's happening <laughs> here mate yeah. come on oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean the number of people i know who have tried to go to hospital in australia recently and had like 20 hour wait times that's true yeah. i did have to wait a long time for my appendix which is a ticking time bomb yeah Listen, we're, we're not as bad as the UK. <laughs> no, we're no, no. as bad as the UK. No, we still have. It's more like we're hospitals. like less yeah. far right. down the uh, down yeah. the same pipeline. Oh, absolutely. We're, listen, we get everything. We get everything laid here. Yeah, you yeah. know, cultural <laughs> movements, collapse uh, of society, societal collapse. Yeah. I am going to talk now about like the logistics of it, the considerations that go into deciding to set one up. And then how you go about it. And last of all, we're going to talk about some of the ways that it can go horribly wrong. Because we can't possibly end on an up note. I'm actually not cynical at all about this whole concept. So I'm out of character. I'm not <laughs> dissing things. I'm not providing <laughs> total Let's see how long that lasts. viewpoints. So mm -hmm. this will be good. Okay. So the first consideration is scale. So if you are wanting to do this, the level at which it operates will determine on who you can cooperate with and how big you can get. Often these things tend to grow alongside a community if the community is growing. And I find that they tend to support the existence of communities. So you can do this between you and a friend, which is not really kind of, it's not the larger scale mutual aid stuff that we think about it. But if you give your mate money and expect that at some point in the future, if you need help, they'll provide it to you. That is a kind of mutual aid. It's worth noting that there's a lot of pre-existing, there's a lot of communities oh, out yeah. there that already function on this church groups are famously Yep. Great and, sources of mutual aid. Um, in fact, that was one of the kind of fundamental structures of like religious groups was to do this sort of thing. Yeah, any women's groups are often um, yep. amazing sources for mutual aid. Uh, youth groups often do a lot of this. Yeah, yeah. It's, it turns out that when humans form communities, they tend to get involved in mutual aid. Could it be that cooperation is a winning strategy? <laughs> right, and just you know, being... <laughs> yeah. yeah no, also, the, the only human strategy. Good luck on your own out there. Yeah. So community scale stuff is the sort of level that I operate on. I do 
do stuff with like online communities, but you can do stuff in the real world in a neighborhood, in a, an apartment block. I mean, in like tenant buildings, organizing within those communities is definitely possible to do and mutual aid within those communities is definitely possible. You do have to get along with your neighbors a bit though, which can be hard. It's tricky. The, the modern condition of, of human life is to be alienated and individual. So yeah. if you don't have access to community, this is hard, but the good news is the internet exists and you can do them online. So the second consideration is trust because fundamentally this is about a relationship of trust. I trust that the people coming to me asking for help need the money that they are asking me for. I don't really care if they need it for exactly what they're telling me. I believe that they need it. I mean, financial stress is the defining feature of modern existence in some respects. But also the people donating money to me to run the fund trust that I'm not going to go off and buy, I don't know, um, CDs, <laughs> I guess. Like the sort of amounts of money that I'm tra trafficking in, <laughs> that I'm dealing with, is not like buy a yacht or whatever, right? But they are trusting that I am going to give it to people who need it and not spend it on myself. CDs. What what kind of CDs are you picturing? <laughs> Fuck, I don't. Like I was ratcheting down, looking about what would be accessible at the price range that I'm thinking about. Uh, oil landscape from the op shop. Blu-rays of seventies gay pornography. <laughs> Hell yes. Oh, we already own it all. We don't need to buy it. <laughs> I want to point out, like, as Tess said, it doesn't matter if somebody needs the money for something other than they say. We did once give money to somebody who turned out to be, like, a uh, compulsive liar. Yeah. But it all, the thing that frustrated us about our interactions with this person is we would have given them the money if they just told us what they needed it for. They didn't have to come up with these bizarre... Fanciful situations, yeah. Fanciful situations about inventing people who are in need. They yeah. could just have Asked. said, I need help with rent. It's like, okay. Yeah. Have some money. And, and also, like, fundamentally, I would much rather give hundreds of dollars to somebody who doesn't quote-unquote need it than deny that to somebody who does because I think they're a bit sus. And also, anyone who's lying for 200 bucks on the internet... Has um, bigger problems. Probably has, is in need. <laughs> you know? Probably needs the money. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Trust is generally easier to manage in a long-standing community or a small community. Trust is also a little bit easier to manage in, like, physical spaces mm. because if it's a neighborhood, you will see those people on the street, right? There is a, a level of familiarity that does that is conducive to trust in a way that the internet is not. I would say that giving to a random GoFundMe campaign is a noble effort, but is probably not the best way, and I hate saying the best way about giving money to people, but probably not the best way to wrangle that sort of thing. Which sucks for people whose only hope of accessing medication or food is something like that due to alienation and the breakdown of the state. Yeah, trust only goes so far, and GoFundMe is... Well, there are no quality controls on GoFundMe. Precisely. One of the yeah. things I'm going to talk about in a bit, actually. But also, GoFundMe, as an avenue for for mutual aid is kind of suboptimal because it's depersonalized. Well, that's yeah. the thing. We're talking about, you know, a community of two is still a community. Yes, but, but GoFundMe is, has no you. community yeah. element whatsoever. So. Yeah. It's kind of a way of like of cashing in clout because like yeah. you have to build yeah. clout very hard, but you don't get any money from it or anything unless you advertise yeah, yeah. and then everyone like, leaves or whatever. But like if you if something does come up or you're just a scammer, you can use GoFundMe as the as the bridge between those things. Yeah. The, the, this is not to say that no GoFundMe campaign is worthwhile or valuable or whatever. It's not. It's no, just absolutely. that I would say the vast majority are ineffective ways in the absence of the built of a built community, basically. Yeah. Which is tragic and sucks. Well, that's it. Like, if you know someone online who's got one. Yeah, yeah. If it, you know it, them, it's then the same go way. for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not... And I mean, I'm going to talk about it as one of the ways that people can use to pool money for something in particular. It might be interesting to think of it that um, mutual aid as opposed to charity, GoFundMe, etc., et is one human supporting another. And for that to be present, there has to be a relationship between those two people. Where you have the abstraction, it becomes purely transactional. I think that that's where it starts to break down. Yeah, so certainly it is a more alienated framework. I don't think that is necessarily the case because you can use a GoFundMe as a way to pool money. Right, right. When I speak of GoFundMe, I just mean sort of the model where you... Randomly put up a campaign. Put up a campaign, yeah, put it on Twitter and yeah. say, please spread this as far as you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I kind of stumbled into doing mutual aid organizing in a coordinated fashion for one particular online community. I started out by just asking anybody who complained about not having the money for something for an account to throw at, typically PayPal, sometimes a bank account if they were also in Australia. Then some people needed more than I could do on my own. So I kind of 
offered to set up a pool of money for them that other people could also donate to. At the end of, sorry, at the start of 2021, this became a centralized fund, initially to help people buy COVID stuff, so masks and rats and things like that. It quickly became more general than that, because it turns out people need more than just support for COVID supplies. Yeah, COVID means you need rent. You yeah. need food, you need help traveling. I mean, um, all kinds of stuff. Do you need a hotel for a night because you're stuck somewhere? Yeah. Well, in terms of ways of doing mutual aid, one of the ones that uh, Tess has done for most of her life and we do together now is um, lending people a couch to sleep on. Yeah, absolutely. A bed. You, yeah. well, you need to have some, you know, that's, that's a, a higher level of trust, but one of the best things you can do for somebody is just house them. Yeah, place to sleep (laughs) for a few days a week. Yeah. So mutual aid is mutual. That doesn't mean everyone can do it equally. Some people will have greater needs. Other people will have more to spare. Sometimes those with needs wind up having resources to spare. And it is, I think, a source of immense pride for a lot of people that I have helped in the past through a mutual aid fund to eventually be able to give back to that fund once they are more stable. You also have situations where somebody who initially has a lot of resources winds up in the shit for something or just comes across something that they can't handle at a particular time. Tess wasn't necessarily in a terrible spot, but one time she was having um, an absolutely shitty time and the community she runs this for um, uh, informed her that she would be buying a bottle of wine out of the... <laughs> yes. <laughs> as, a, as a mutual aid. Yeah. And given that Tess's motto is... Uh, mutual, by force if necessary. Mutual aid, by force <laughs> if necessary. She had, she had no grounds to resist this. I was very grumpy about that, actually. <laughs> She complained, and then she complained slightly drunkenly. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. All right, so the logistics of doing this sort of thing... I'm going to talk about monetary um, because that's the easiest way and the way that I mostly deal with. Most of the other things are a case of like a case by case basis where you do a particular thing. You get a particular object for somebody or you do a particular like job or whatever. Those are less abstract than a pool of money. And so they're kind of typically done on a case by case basis and you don't worry about accounting for them because they're kind of discrete things. When you are dealing with a pool of money that people are donating to and then other people are kind of getting don- like money from, you kind of need a way to deal with that. So first of all, you need some sort of account or a sequence or a set of accounts that will actually hold the money for you. So this could be a combination of banks or WISE, which is a like, like PayPal, but better, also PayPal. So these are services that allow you to hold money in like a savings account or something, and also manage the transfers between people giving you money and you sending money to the people who need it. Same currency is generally easier. Services like WISE and PayPal let you do cross-currency stuff that they usually charge fees for that. PayPal charges more in general than WISE, but it's pretty comparable. Some banks will let you do international transfers as well, but that's typically a pain in the ass and they charge even more than PayPal or Wise do. Mm-hmm. Yes, and unlike um, uh, corporations, you can't just get an international low friction account. So I, would, I guess you could open an account or any of the countries you're operating in. So um, US people. Well, so Wise allows you to have accounts in different currencies that you can transfer money between. Right. They all function as like digital money stores, but it's only in a set number of countries because that where, is where they have been able to be compliant with local laws. Mm-hmm. Unlike the PayPal approach of move fast, break things and then suddenly panic and have to close a lot of accounts because suddenly you discover you're breaking local laws. So I would say that- Oh, like PayPal just steals money off people all the time as well. Oh yeah, (laughs) absolutely. So I would would not use PayPal if other options are available, but it's pretty big as a service, so people still do. And some people only have PayPal set up to receive money, so- Yeah. The other thing that is kind of important as like an account keeping tool is documentation. There are a couple of different ways you can do this. The first is to basically have- Somewhere, a number that represents the available funds, it gets added to if somebody donates money, it gets withdrawn from if somebody needs money given to them. Double entry bookkeeping. Yeah, exactly. Changed the fucking world. (laughs) It did, it did. So in the description of this episode, there will be a link to a Google Sheet, or two Google Sheets. The first will be an example of something that I use for a particular thing. So like if somebody says, hey, I need like 800 bucks to pay rent, and I will set this up. It has a column for the date of the transaction, it has a column for money that comes in, it has a column for money that goes out, each row is a particular transaction. And this just allows you to keep track of how much money is currently available. The second Google Sheet is something for a community level fund. 
So it has a kind of a summary page to tell you information about what's in the fund at the moment. And then it has pages for each individual year set out like that individual one. So I run one of these and it's basically just there to keep track of how much money is in it. I and also un- you can show people where their money went. Yeah, exactly. So the mm-hmm. advantage of this, if you publicize it, and these are anonymized transactions, so no names are associated with them, just dates, is that it gives a level of transparency, at least to the incoming money, because somebody can say, hey, I donated 50 bucks. Oh, here, a $50 donation has shown up. That's probably my money. Yeah. I'm just going to put it out there that you still have to trust the person running the fund that what is in the document is true. Yeah. Because I could, if I was a malicious actor or somebody looking to steal from this fund, just put in like imaginary requests for money and extract money that way. It's worth noting, though, that these things aren't the people donating and the people who are receiving money often aren't isolated from each other. If it's taking place in a community, yeah. just because the record is anonymized doesn't mean, hey, just wanted somebody doesn't say, hey, we just wanted to thank everyone for help with rent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Instead, instead, that they does can disclose happen. that on them, th- themselves. But. Yeah, so that does happen, but a lot of the private requests are not so publicized. So right. there is a limit to the accountability that is available when you have this kind of anonymized system. I think that the anonymization is beneficial. I think that it makes it more accessible to people who need help because they don't have the details of that publicized in a way that can make them feel ashamed. But if you are worried about that, you can add information. I wouldn't because I think it is useful in a political sense to not keep that information readily available. (laughs) (laughs) You said we weren't talking politics till the third episode. All of this is political. This is about material conditions. (sighs) I'm sorry. (laughs) And to our as someone who has taken money from Tessa's mutual aid fund, it really is beneficial not to have to keep that information anonymized because I definitely would have been too ashamed to ask if uh, if yeah. that information was being kept. Yeah, absolutely. So so in lowering the thresholds to having people ask for support, I think is a is a beneficial thing, even if there is a loss of transparency there. And you know, your mileage for your particular community will vary. And this is a discussion that you can have if you are looking to set this up. Again, trust is so central and so important to these systems that I think it is worth having that conversation and being as transparent as possible. Yeah, it's much easier to do this in a community where that trust already exists than necessarily just trying to set it up for this purpose. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the reasons that leftist communities are often one of them or people with like disadvantaged groups who have a shared... I guess, group interest as a result of those disadvantage, precisely because there is a level of trust that comes with those sorts of things. Yeah, or a community that you just happen to be in where it's quite friendly, like um, you've helped people who um, go to the local breakfast place you go to Yeah, and are friendly with. There's a a friend group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a trust, right? I would argue against this being common practice in leftist groups just because everyone hates each other in those, usually. (laughs) No, no, that's that's common practice (laughs) across leftist groups. Within (laughs) leftist groups, it's fine. It's the fighting between them that causes the conflict. (laughs) So there are a whole bunch of um, services these days that exist to do this sort of thing. Uh, Not necessarily, they were not really built for the purpose of mutual aid. They were built for the purpose of fundraising, broadly defined. But mutual aid can be thought of as kind of a type of fundraising, I guess. These are are crowdfunding. Yeah, these are crowdfunding. Well, one of them is crowdfunding. So the one that is crowdfunding is Kickstarter. Kickstarter isn't a community fundraising model. It's a business funding fundraising model. Because the idea is that you have to achieve your target funds before you can get access to any of it, because that is what you said you need to do the project. Right. Can you even do like GoFundMe style campaigns through Kickstarter? What do you mean? Like, can you do a, hey, I need insulin or I will die? Yeah, you can. There is, as far as I can tell, there is no actual control on who or what a Kickstarter can be. The only kind of restriction there is that you have to achieve a minimum funding level before you get access to the funds. Yeah, Man, actually. That would really suck if you were 10 bucks short. Oh, <laughs> I die. Well, okay, no joke, it does. GoFundMe as a different sort of model, you get access to the pool of money immediately. You don't so have you can to- dive into it. Like Scrooge McDuck? You can. It would hurt. <laughs> like Scrooge McDuck. Yeah. Well, it's digital money, so it wouldn't hurt at all, actually. Yeah, you just hit the floor. Well, it's a digital pool. You fall forever. Oh, I'm digitally jumping. 
So I would digitally hurt. Okay, we've worked it out. Yeah. We've worked it out. Yeah. Thank it's you. It's like when you lose in Mario. Yes, precisely. Yeah. yeah. That's, what, 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 what the fuck are we talking about? <laughs> I'll just drink your water. I'll do the next bit. Chuffed, says the notes. The no, we're talking chuffed? about GoFundMe. Hang on. We so, know what GoFundMe is. What's chuffed? No, there's, there's an important part of this to know, which is that GoFundMe takes a cut of everything. Yeah, well. So this that. is important to know because they, you may or may not realize that before you go in, right? They state it clearly, but people can still go into this sort of thing not being aware of it and then find that a bit stuck. I want to point out that we've talked about accounts and whatnot, but the mutual aid fund can also be like just direct transfer from one person to another. Yep. And then you just make sure to put it in the sheet. As well, that, that is how my mutual aid functions, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Chuffed is another one. I think it behaves like GoFundMe. I don't know a hell of a lot about it, but it is just another of these online services. Uh, PayPal Pools was kind of PayPal's response to GoFundMe. It was originally free, like PayPal didn't take a cut of that outside of like transaction fees. Now it does take a cut because it wasn't sufficiently profitable otherwise. Scrooge McDuck wanted to dive in somewhere different. <laughs> <laughs> so arguably, these are more transparent on the input side, right? Because all of the all of the transactions are recorded, even if who it comes from is anonymized, right? Compared to doing your own documentation, this is more public about how much money is coming in. These do not, as far as I can tell, ever tell you how much money has left the pool. So they are not at all transparent. In fact, they do not show any information about what is coming out. Although people would, I mean, people would know who the GoFundMe was for, right? Yes, but if you are running a mutual aid fund... Oh, out of a GoFundMe. Out of a GoFundMe. Don't be doing this. Uh, well, no, I mean, do not look, do this. If it works for somebody, sure, whatever. I don't think it's a particularly good mechanism. If it works for somebody, there's a be- there is a better option for them. <laughs> I would say so, yes. Which is to run it yourself and have your own accounting system that you then give transparency to through stuff like the Google Docs, like Google Spreadsheets linked below. In terms of using fundraising services, I typically don't unless somebody in particular wants to use one for something specific. If they have that 800 bucks that they need rent for and they are trying to fundraise across a couple of different communities, they may set up a GoFundMe that I will then advertise on their behalf or something like that. But that is very much, it is for this particular project, for this particular person. I, I hadn't thought of that. Or, or community as well. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, I mean, there are a lot of like GoFundMe and Chuffed projects for like unions that are fundraising for a strike or something like that. So these that is a more institutional level of fundraising than mutual aid funds tend to be. Like, I, I am not actually an organization doing this. I'm just one person who happened to stumble into that role in many respects. So my setup is to have a community spreadsheet which documents the transactions that are done in and out. It documents date and the amount. It does not have any personal information um, attached to those. It, it's structured like the, the example sheet below. So there's a summary page that's says things like how much is currently available in the fund and there are kind of yearly summaries of what's gone on in that particular year. I then have people send me money across a couple of different accounts. So I have bank account, PayPal, and Wise are the ones that I typically work with. People send me money saying this is for this particular mutual aid fund. I then update the record to show that that money has come in. If somebody needs money, they tell me how much they need and they give me some service that I can transfer it through bank account, PayPal, or Wise typically. And I just send them the money and record the fact that on this date, this much money was withdrawn from the fund. I don't think you have to be this fancy about it. It's nice, but at the end of the day, as long as people are getting the help they need. The main reason for doing that kind of account keeping is that I know how much money is available. Yeah. And also that the transparency does raise the amount of trust. I don't think that is necessarily... I I get why that happens, but because it's so easy to fake the the transparency, I'm not... I don't trust it, if you will. Right, but yes. I was just saying that there's, there's plenty of communities where this would particular model might not be super tenable, but the important thing is just that... Yeah, well, we're going to talk about them, uh, some examples of where you might not want that kind of uh, accounting to be public. But in general, somewhere, having a record of how much money is present is really important. So the, the time cost of doing this is not actually that big, so long as you're not relentlessly doing transactions anyway, in which case, chances are you're dealing with a lot more money than I have any experience time. So it's for me, it's not a huge amount of work, even though I am doing all this bookkeeping more or less manually. You've made it sound way more complex than it is. It's not really. When you actually go and have a look at the, the examples, it's not that bad. It's just writing a line in a spreadsheet when something happens. Yeah, pretty much. The main reason to do the documentation, even if you don't publicize it, is that it makes it way easier to keep track of what's going on. So I try to update mine the same day when a transaction comes in. 
but the transactions don't come in every day. You usually have like clusters of them. I will say that if you require people to verify that they need money for something, you will make it much, much harder for yourself. Also, means testing is for libs. Yeah, if you're in a community where you don't trust people enough to just give them money... This is probably not a good model. This is probably not the, <laughs> the community where you really want to get involved in mutual aid that much. Yeah. So there are various ideological barriers to doing this sort of thing. Frankly, the Americans that I know are by far the worst at this. Uh, you try to give money to a Midwestern person, they act like you've offered to shoot them in the face. Yeah, well, <laughs> actually even more than even more insulting yeah them. yeah <laughs> at least that would get them out of paying rent exactly have you ever known an american to like be accepting of help at all yes you but i have to bully them into it this is why you know the catchphrase is mutual aid by force of necessary make it relentless make it shameless I am incredibly persistent. If you are the guy in your community for this, make it clear that you want to be pinged or contacted anytime somebody expresses the slightest hint of financial need, because then other people in the community will just will just contact me, be like, hey, this person was posting in this channel quite publicly in the channel to say they need help, and then I'll show up and be like, you, tell me your PayPal. <laughs> it works. I mean, sometimes it takes like five or ten minutes to convince them that no, actually just needing help is enough. Yeah, I mean, uh, not to tread on the toes of the next episode or whatnot, but there's a lot of ideology and political conditioning that goes into making people not want to accept help. And it's usually do they are trying to refuse on... Shame grounds, typically. Shame grounds, yeah. but also sometimes they think somebody needs it more. Well, that that is inevitably sourced from shame, right? It's I am not worthy of being helped. I am not morally valuable enough or my hurt or my need is not sufficiently great. Oh, I do think there's an element which is just concerned that they don't want to take away from somebody who may be more in need. Yeah. Because it's very easy to imagine somebody who's worse off than you. It's just... Oh, yeah, and boy, are we taught to imagine them all the time. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. To overcome that, you just, you have to be forceful. You have to... You have to be relentless you and have shameless. You yeah. pop the, 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 the bubble of social convention, which is to say... Talk about money, for one thing, which is often... I mean, People don't want to do. Dean doesn't want to talk about money ever, for example. This is why I let Tess... I just <laughs> contribute money and then Tess can give it to people. Yeah. <laughs> but, but to make it obvious that you are willing to talk about money and that expressing a need for material things is not a source of shame. That is a, that There is one level of barrier to get through there. But also that people can ask for help and that, in fact... No, if you just need a break from the relentless pressure to go and have a pizza, that's valid. You know, yeah. even if it's not like, oh, I need rent or I'm getting whatever. Yeah. Pizza is an antidepressant. That's right. <laughs> Pizza is an anti-anxiety medication. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just looking at my notes. The one last thing that I want to say about um, doing it is that if the fund is running low that I run, which means either it's close to zero or I have had to boost it a bit so it's negative, I will just publicly say, hey, the fund needs more money. Yeah, you got to be as, as <laughs> open to asking for money as you are about offering to give it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is made easier if there are people who are making regular donations, which I have some of. And of course, it's made easier if you have people who can make regular donations. But in general... Like, I, I am completely shameless about saying, hey, this fund needs more money. Here are the details. Make it easy for people. Okay, now I have a section titled, What Can Go Wrong? Which is my paranoia and cynicism coming to play. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about some examples already. Yeah. People the, can, can lie to you. Or well, not just stuff, that, but... but the first one on this list is everyone involved is actually too alienated. So this mostly comes from not my personal experience, but Hussein on Trash Future said... During the start of COVID, he tried to get organized to sorry, to get involved with a local mutual aid group, which were basically just distributing food in wherever he lives in London, I think it is. And he actually met people who were so alienated from their community that they were like counting the number of cans of beans that were going out to a particular household. I mean, like, oh, that, that person doesn't deserve an extra can of beans or whatever. And he found this experience to be incredibly disappointing and depressing and actually put him off of doing mutual aid in the local area because there were just people who were so insanely alienated that they were willing to do that. Yeah, they weren't involved... 
They weren't doing mutual aid. They were literally bean counting. <laughs> yes, yes, literally fucking bean counting. There are also situations of times aid. come down in the UK. <laughs> People have to count actual beans. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, like the the roughly twenty percent of the population of the US who appear to have gone actually insane over COVID, they do exhibit some examples of mutual aid going on within those communities. But they're also so many of them are just grifters. And yeah, good luck. I mean, good luck running this in a, a freaking right wing reactionary space like yeah well yeah i mean it does happen but one of the reasons that this is easier to do and generally lasts longer in left-wing spaces is that people have a ideological commitment to the, the principles that underlie it. I would say that uh, one thing that beats that is kind of like evangelical Christianity, who tend to like practice it quite mm-hmm. well and be quite conservative at the same time. Like, it's- Yeah, so that is done at an institutional level that I don't think quite counts. Yeah. And famously, yeah. churches, they have all the infrastructure from being a church, which... which yeah, and also they are not... They don't actually have the if you need it it's their principle there is a gatekeeping which is you have to be an evangelical christian to sure. access it right but, um, so so yeah well no there is no, we'll get no, to, no. there is gatekeeping involved in these mutual aid structures because i'm not in communities with fascists yeah right and that i don't know if i would be willing to help a fascist who was like hey i need food I don't know. I think that there are people, better people than me, who probably would be willing to do that. I don't know if I would be. You do but- not, in fact, have to hand it to them, and it can be a can of beans. <laughs> <laughs> Although, given the people were throwing cans of soup at fascists, might we call that an <laughs> element of leftist mutual aid? <laughs> but in, in general, right, because these community these communities in which this stuff operates, there is typically some sort of ideological barrier to entry sometimes there is a material barrier to entry if it's like patreon guarded or whatever these are gate kept in a fashion but i don't think it's the same i don't think it's quite the same as insisting that somebody is religious in a particular way in order to access money for a church well i think that there's a there's a distinction between like talking about gatekeeping and access and, and verification and all that. At, like we were talking about, this is a this is a an, a process that that happens between humans. Yes, there must be a community, and there is no community unless there is some self selection among that group for shared interest. For yeah. shared interest, yeah. Whether it be the shared interest in the environment that they're sharing, a, a hobby that they're involved in, a religion that they are um, worshiping or, or following. Or just, you know, an online space that has developed so that everyone is friends. Yeah. That element has to be there. Otherwise, it is alienated. It is abstracted. It stops being mutual aid at that point. Mm. And so I'd say, you know, the question of uh, do you feel obligated to offer help to a fascist? It's like, well, would a fascist be in those communities? Well, no, this is why I have not had to confront that, right? Right, but I would say that... If you were trying to organize a mutual aid thing for a local community, you might. Well, I would say not to get too into the political thing in the next two episodes, that there might be a political utility to providing mutual aid to a fascist, but... um, We'll talk about that when we get to it. Certainly when it comes to like the kind of online communities that I've done this for, it hasn't been an issue because there just aren't fascists there. They get right. banned if they show up. <laughs> and they don't want to be there. They'll, they'll fucking hate it there. There's a whole bunch of people with fucking... It's too gay. Yeah, with, with their names are trans puns that they're all talking about. Girl deck, know, yeah. What everyone, what everyone talks about on that community. I'm not in the community. <laughs> just, they're fucking degenerates. So another big thing that is somewhat related to alienation is if trust gets broken, it is very, very difficult, often impossible to rebuild. So this is usually trust at the level of the person organizing the fund. But if somebody lies about about their need, that is a breach of trust as well. You lose your what we're saying. This is there's an element of clout in this. If you lose your standing in the community, yeah, you lose access to that community resources. It's again fundamentally this is the formation of a little village. Yeah, if you turn out to be the the asshole rogue at the back of the tavern, no one's no one's buying you free beer. It's not happening. <laughs> I would say that though that that is the function of the state because people who have pissed everyone off still deserve to have a basic standard of living. Well, yeah, so this is where you are going from mutual aid structures as, like, person to person to institutional structures where you do need to provide even for the assholes, let's say. So within that broken trust, this doesn't necessarily mean that the person running the mutual aid fund can never receive help. It just means that they need to do it openly so they don't get the privacy that people who aren't running the mutual aid fund get. So, for example, at one point when Dean wasn't working, 
we had some bills that had just come in a lump and um, my savings were run down and so on and so on, right? So I basically said in this community where I run the fund, hey, I need 200 bucks to pay this bill. Does anybody object to me taking it out of the mutual aid fund? Of course, everybody says, no, we don't object at all. But that level of transparency is a form of accountability, which means that I am willing to take 200 bucks from mutual aid fund so long as people know that I have done it. And again, even just in the, to put it in another framing, yes, it's a matter of sort of systemic accountability and all this stuff. But again, you're a community. Yeah, yeah. It would be a bad look for the treasurer to be taking money out and have to be asked, why are you doing that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I am not allowing myself the privacy of just doing it. And there are, maybe the trust is there that you could do it, but it's Sure, just- but I don't want that. Yeah, this is a choice that I am making, and I think it is the responsible one to do in the context that I'm working. Yeah, but with this, there it, are it, the, the underlying rule. Yeah, is not that this is like a the the uh, like a requirement. The underlying no, rule. I mean, is it turns to... out that it's you can't really put requirements on this because people are just kind of doing it on the fly. Right. Anyway, right exactly. Yeah. But that's yeah. what I'm saying is you, you have to you have to manage the fund in a way that is responsible, uh, responsible, and, yeah. and the way that is uh, in keeping with the community standards. Yeah, yeah. I would not be surprised if there are cases where the person running the fund just makes off with the money. I think that that is really damaging. Not just to that particular community, but those people are not necessarily going to trust the next mutual aid fund that comes along. I mean, in in any place where these community structures are subverted by somebody taking advantage, it is actively damaging to those things, right? This is just a particular case of that. Ways of reducing that risk is to potentially have more than one person involved in managing a mutual aid fund, which can be made difficult if, if, because you have to have like the accounts accessible by more than one person then. But also if you just don't stock pile lots and lots of money, that means that there's less available at any particular time to be made off with. Or to tempt. Or to tempt, yeah. Somebody with. But, but again, pick somebody you trust and make sure you're doing it in a community where people don't often just take the money and run because oftentimes that means they... The social cost is huge. Yeah, yeah. they can't go back to this community that might be a huge part of their lives. Yeah. yeah. So I think that the more likely in place is just somebody subtly taking small amounts over time, which is harder to guard against. But again, this is where the trust and the fact that you need somebody committed to it to yeah. really do it. At the it. end of the day, none of, this, none of this works without trust. Yeah. None of this works without the community. Yeah. So another thing that can happen is that you just don't have enough money to make it work. Uh, Small and poor communities are more common for this. I mean, there's a slightly bitterly funny joke in trans Twitter that the same 20 bucks has been passed between many accounts. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, what you do then is that money is not the only way to do this. Your time and your work are valuable as well. They can just be more difficult to provide over a long distance. Yeah. Somebody needs a lift. Tess wants offered to drive somebody's car across how many thousands of kilometers? Oh, let's be honest, that was mostly so I would get a holiday in Tasmania for a few days. <laughs> <laughs> that was not entirely altruistic. <laughs> well, you know, nothing's entirely altruistic. But yeah, yeah. yeah you can lend somebody a couch. You can um, mow their lawn. Pay somebody's- Take them dinner. Mow their lawn. Whatever, right? Yeah. There are yeah. ways of doing this that are not directly monetary. Money is just a fairly easy to manage and very abstracted way of doing mm-hmm. it. Two hours cleaning someone's house can change, change a life. Change someone's life. Yeah. yeah. So another thing that can happen is that whatever services you're using to manage the money get fucked. You can you can get pinged for fraud because you're doing a lot of transfers. I haven't run into any of this, but you know, I've heard stories. PayPal is notoriously a pain in the ass for this because it has a ropey relationship with legality a lot of the time and it's kind of knee jerk response to rope like tenuous. You've not heard the term ropey before? No. Oh. PayPal is notoriously difficult for this stuff because its reaction to anything being slightly suspicious is basically to lock your account and never let you back in. People have lost thousands of dollars to this. Um, it's one of the reasons that if you can avoid PayPal, do. Wise, so far, is typically more sensible for that sort of thing, I think, because it was deliberately set up to avoid those pitfalls. But also, sex workers have complained about Wise shutting them out, so who knows. As I said, I have not had to wrangle this myself, but there are cases of people getting their accounts locked and losing money. Risk for this can be minimized by just not keeping a lot of money in the pool at any given time, particularly on things like PayPal. Wait, I've just had a great idea. We want anonymous... We are not using fucking crypto. (laughs) Why don't we put mutual aid on the blockchain? But that way no. there's, a li- there's a record of all transactions. No, it's, but it's 100% uh... <laughs> secure. I mean, like the one... Yeah, but I want to actually be able to do a transaction. <laughs> um, the one thing I will say about crypto is, though, that uh, if you want to give to charities that operate in, for example, Palestine, it's very yeah. hard to get money in. Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, this is a, a very real issue in general with this sort of thing is that digital currency is easier to control on the whole. Yeah. I have personally donated over 60 apes <laughs> to Palestinian, <laughs> Palestinian aid groups. Um, Palestinian? <laughs> I tr- I'm still caught on fucking ropey, all right? <laughs> I once Googled, can you donate money to the PFLP and found out it was a registered terrorist organization. <laughs> so I'm probably on a watch list. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so did ASIO show up on your doorstep for that hasn't, one? Hasn't yet, but uh, we shall see. Okay. Look, if you're not on a list yet, being on this podcast <laughs> probably puts you on one. Don't flatter ourselves that much. <laughs> Listen, you will have to add yourself to a list. Go to Google and type in... <laughs> <laughs> hey Google. <laughs> <laughs> so I this is another hypothetical one, but theoretically there may be tax implications if the tax man sees you moving a lot of money around. If you are wrangling a large fund, this is more likely, but because these are all like gifts, they are not actually income, so I think you're in the clear, you just have to be able to document it. And also, if you're working in a really poor community, good news, mm-hmm. it's probably all tax-free anyway. <laughs> Another one that can happen is like doxing, identity theft, and that sort of thing. So your basic cybersecurity is relevant here. I would suggest using WISE and PayPal or a separate bank account to the bank accounts you use for other things. That makes it a little bit safer, at least. This is what we would call an air gap. Basically, you use separate accounts for different things. Typically, bank account details alone aren't enough to do identity theft. I would not go broadcasting them to a large community or in public, though. If you do use a bank account or you have one attached to services such as PayPal, make sure it's not one with all of your savings money in it because you do not want, if you have savings anyway, you don't want that to just vanish. Also, use a password manager for those things so it's a little bit more secure in that regard. General cybersecurity stuff is... If you are dealing with a direct exchange of goods instead of money... Uh, Use a post box if you can. Don't necessarily use your address if it's possible for you. And for the love of God, do not publish the names or identifying info for the people who send or accept money from you. Unless you have their explicit consent, and even then I probably wouldn't. For bigger specific items, you can do like separate funds that are explicitly connected to the person receiving the money. But I just generally avoid having that information recorded because if it doesn't exist, nobody can download it for malicious reasons. Yeah, you know, the cops can't come and take it off you, etc. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, no joke, the next thing on the list is being accused of crimes. <laughs> I was also going to say that um, in terms of your address, uh, I feel comfortable as a, a larger man having people come and Stay on our couch, yeah. Stay on the couch, I don't feel threatened by that. You know, don't do things you're not comfortable doing. There will be some people who have higher safety concerns than others, right? Yeah, and some people, we say, like, be pushy about offering people aid, but when it's like going to someone's house to offer cleaning, don't be pushy about no, that. No, 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 no. <laughs> pushy <laughs> about let me throw money at you is me directly empowering somebody, yeah. right? It's right, not yeah. asking to be in their space. Oh, you said your toilet's dirty? I'm coming to clean You can it. be pushy, but still but be I'm polite. I'm approaching your location. <laughs> you better open the fucking door. <laughs> so I don't think that being accused of crimes is very likely Uh, unless you are in the US and you're operating a bail fund because a bunch of states have made those a crime. What? I am not joking. On what grounds? Terrorism. What? I am not fucking joking. So this was about the- (laughs) My uh, friend got caught with weed and I helped him get out of prison. I am a terrorist. How can weed get keep getting cooler? <laughs> well, I think in this specific case, it was um, like bail funds around uh, people protesting the cop city development. Oh, right. So um, environmentalists. So exercising their First Amendment rights and yeah, stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Having a constitution is cool. so cool. Like, I know we've <laughs> yeah. got one, but there's, there's nothing in it. It's just like division between like the states and the federal yeah, it's parliament. A, yeah. it's, a like, bureaucr- it's a bureaucratic document, yeah. But like having like a, a romantic constitution is so fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> so another one. You get is- so angry about how it's being violated or something <laughs> treads on your head. Yeah. Another one that's di- uh, getting increasingly dicey in parts of the US is abortion funds. So these are a kind of mutual aid fund that specifically is intended to provide abortion support. Yeah. And in the various states where that is now illegal, they are cracking down on this sort of thing. I am not at all qualified to give advice on cybersecurity in those cases. What I can say is that the best defense against the cops knocking on your door and demanding information on those transactions is to just not keep it. If you don't have those records, they can't require them. And if you're somebody who's listening to this podcast, you have ADHD or somewhere on the spectrum and you can just say you forgot. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. One thing I will say in the context of like the record keeping systems that I'm suggesting is that instead of having a document where you keep records of transaction dates and amounts of money, you can just have a single number that represents the currently available funds. Anytime a transaction happens, you change that number, but you don't record the transaction. Yeah. And that could be... Again, as long as the community is happy with that and it meets their standards. Yeah, uh, that works. Provided serving the need. I did notice the next thing in the notes there, which is that uh, you could get accused of dealing drugs. And I want to endorse this because providing somebody with drugs in a time of need is mutual aid. <laughs> if pizza this is, is an not legal advice, but it might be financial advice. If, if pizza <laughs> is an uh, antidepressant, then weed is definitely an anti-anxiety drug. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I would suggest that if you are also dealing drugs, air gap those two systems. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to be doing two cool things, make sure you don't cross the streams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mostly because you don't want the people you're providing mutual aid fund, mutual aid support to, to get caught up in your drug dealing. Unless, of course, again, you're doing mutual aid by providing them the drugs, in which case you should probably not charge them money for it because yeah. it's not mutual aid. Then that's not drug dealing. No, it's not. It's it's like drug gifting. Yeah. You're like drug count. Santa. <laughs> The drug gift economy. <laughs> to all the little boys and girls, yes. <laughs> you know if they've been naughty or nice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's it. That's the end that's of the it. notes. That's the end of the notes. But I hope this has at least given some people some idea of what they can do. I guess if you have questions about what I do, you can send them to me and I might be able to ask answer them. I'm not going to give identifying information, obviously. I have helped some people set this up for other communities as well. It's just genuinely a good thing to do that helps people. There's no more risks on that one, I think. Nope. Oh, man, I had to. There's so much. we got to do the next episode soon because I'm first. <laughs> that's all the stuff I have interesting commentary about. Yeah, I mean, this what is, this is yeah, a boring yeah. episode about resistance, yeah. <laughs> Good thing we're leading with this. That's really going to entice people to listen to the rest of the series. <laughs> oh, it'll get spicy. We might have to censor some threats. I'm not sure. <laughs> Google. Hey, Google. <laughs> hey, Google. <laughs> Alexa, Google. <laughs> All right, I think that's us. I'm looking forward to it. Next yep. episode. See you next time. Uh, do we have a name for the listeners of this podcast? Listeners. See you later, listeners. <laughs> and the alligators that may or may not be listening. Right into the podcast and let us know what you'd like to be called. <laughs> Unless you're a degenerate, in which case keep that shit to yourself. <laughs> Listen, you've got to up your Patreon tier a long way to get called names. I will not satisfy your degradation kink on this podcast. I will, I will satisfy your degradation kink if you pay us enough. Okay. Uh, so, dear listener, I used to plug my Twitter on here, but I think I want to plug my letterbox because I enjoy writing little fucking reviews about movies over there. It's very delightful to me. So, Sick. follow okay. me on letterbox at Snitch and Orwell. With yeah, no I'll give you the link to that and I'll actually put it in the notes. Ooh, nice. Ooh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to go in food. Bye. Bye. <laughs>